Ahoy and welcome to the Salty Dog, a special segment of the Catholic Men's Podcast, where we tell many a yawn for youngsters. Grab your grog, and we can begin. Experiment 13 from Centerberg Tales by Robert McCluskey. The Centerberg courthouse clock was just striking eight as Homer rode into the town square. He parked his bike in front of the barber shop, poked his finger into a crack on the wooden barber pole, and pulled out a key. After unlocking the door and putting up the shades, Homer swept the floor. By quarter of nine, Homer had finished with all of his opening up chores. He started looking through the stack of old magazines, the same magazines that had been there last Saturday and the Saturday before, the same magazines that had been in the barber shop since Homer started working there. Homer had looked at them all a hundred times, so he just sat looking out of the window, waiting for the barber to arrive at nine o'clock. Through the barbershop window, he watched the sheriff walk across the square at ten minutes to nine, as usual, and go into Uncle Ulysses' lunchroom for breakfast. He watched the mayor drive up and go into the town hall at five minutes of nine, as usual. The courthouse clock struck nine, and Homer yawned. Just for variety, he looked in the mirror so that he could see the town square backwards. Then, by sitting in the barber chair and leaning way back, he looked in the mirror and saw the town square upside down and backwards. Homer smiled as he watched the barber come out of the lunchroom upside down. Boosting himself out of the barber chair, Homer looked at the clock and thought, he's a little bit late, as usual. Then he said, gosh, to nobody in particular. Everything is so usual around here. Seems as though nothing ever happens here anymore. Morning, Homer, the barber said as he came in. I see we are open and ready for business. It was the same thing that the barber said every Saturday morning. Good morning, Mr. Biggs, said Homer, watching the barber take off his coat and hat and hang them on the same hook he always hung them on. Now he will put on his eye shade, thought Homer, and his white jacket with the two buttons missing. Next, he'll take his razor from the little white cabinet marked sterilizer and begin to strop it. While the barber was stropping his razor, the door opened and Homer knew exactly who it would be. He said, hello, sheriff, without even having to look. Good morning, everybody, the sheriff greeted and sat down in the barber chair to be shaved. Just as the barber finished shaving the sheriff and Homer finished shining the sheriff's shoes, Uncle Ulysses arrived right on schedule and just as usual. Anything new? asked Uncle Ulysses. Homer shook his head and the barber said, Nope. Things are mighty slow, said the sheriff with a yawn. No new magazines? asked Uncle Ulysses, hopefully, looking through the same old stack. Then he glanced up and said, "Uh Uh-oh. And the sheriff, the barber, Homer, and Uncle Ulysses moved over to the window to look. Dulcy Dooner and Lawyer Stobbs were hurrying across the square just as fast as they could go. Something's up, said the barber. Where are they going, mused Uncle Ulysses. Looks like they're bedded for the hank, uh, I mean, headed for the bank, said the sheriff. The bank doesn't open until 9.30, said Homer. Clear across the square, they heard Dulcy bang on the door of the bank and shout, Open up! Open the door, I say! and they saw the door of the bank open two minutes before 9.30 and Dulcie and Lawyer Stobbs go inside. First time the bank ever let anybody in before 9.30 for as long as I remember, said Uncle Ulysses. Dulcie is sure excited about something, said the sheriff. Usually he isn't even up this time of day. Say, Homer, said the barber, looking into the cash drawer. I seem to be running out of change. You take these two dollars and run over to the bank and get me some nickels. All right, Mr. Biggs, Homer agreed, and the sheriff and the barber and Uncle Ulysses stood by the open door while he ran across the square and into the bank. Shh, listen, said Uncle Ulysses. I can hear Dulcie shouting. He just yelled, 90 grand, whispered the barber. No, he didn't, Uncle Ulysses disagreed. He said, I demand. Here comes Homer, said the sheriff. We'll soon know what all the fuss is about. What's going on, son, he asked. Has Dulcie got ninety grand? asked the barber, reaching for his two dollars worth of nickels. What's he demanding? asked Uncle Ulysses. Dulcie is demanding, and maybe he's got ninety grand. 
That's what he's demanding to find out, said Homer. Dulcie's uncle Derpy Dooner died of fever over in Africa, and he left everything to Dulcie. That's nothing to be so mad about, said Uncle Ulysses. Nah, the barber agreed. Dulcie will be a rich man. Having money should make him easier to get along with, said the sheriff. Well, Dulcie hasn't got any money, not yet anyway, said Homer. All he's got so far is that old greenhouse and ten acres of land where Derpy Dooner used to run his seed businesses before he got to be so famous. Why, Derpy Dooner must have made lots of money, said the barber. Sure, agreed the sheriff, being such a famous scientist, I mean, famous scientist, and going on expeditions all over the world. Well, Dulcie and Lawyer Stobbs can't find any money. They've looked everywhere and gone through all of the papers. There were no bank books or stocks or bonds or anything. All they found was a key to a safe deposit box, and that must be where all the money is. Dulcie is so mad because they're making him sign a lot of papers before they let him go into the vault and unlock the box. Sounds like things have calmed down over there, said Uncle Ulysses, cocking an ear. I think I'll just walk across and cash a small check. I've been needing a new blotter, so I'll just come along, said the sheriff. The barber went along to get some more change, and Homer ran along behind to take the sheriff his coat. No telling, the sheriff might need his badge. As they went into the bank, the banker was just opening the heavy door of the vault. Just step inside, Mr. Dooner, he said. Here is the deposit box, number 113. It's about time, growled Dulcie, jabbing his key into the lock. The sheriff, the barber, Uncle Ulysses, and Homer all crowded up to the counter and peered through the bars to watch. Dulcie turned the key and pulled out the box. His hands shook so much with excitement that he had trouble opening the lid. He finally managed to get it open, and then he let out a wild howl. What kind of joke is this? He yelled, and he jumped around something awful, banging the vault, bumping the banker, and bumping the lawyer. Take care, Mr. Dooner, you'll break it, shouted the banker, grabbing Dulcie by the arm before he could throw the something that was in the box. Calm down, Dulcie, the lawyer demanded. Let's be sensible and take it out in the light and examine it. Of all the lousy tricks, growled Dulcie, holding a small glass jar up to the light. What's in it? Uncle Ulysses demanded through the paying teller window. Ah, nuts, said Dulcie, giving the jar a shake. Did you say nuts? asked the sheriff. No, yelled Dulcie. It's a lousy jar of seeds. A most unusual place for keeping seeds, said the banker. Maybe they are unusual seeds, Homer suggested. Yes, Dulcie, they are no doubt very valuable seeds, said the lawyer. That little glass jar might be worth a fortune. Why else would Derpy Dooner keep it locked up in the bank? Look here, there's a label that says Experiment 13. The thought of owning a jar of valuable seeds made Dulcie less mad, but he was far from happy. He shook his head sadly and said, People inherit money every day, and I have to be the one that inherits a jar of seeds. An experiment at that. What are you going to do with your seeds, Dulcie? asked Homer. Well, said Dulcie, rubbing his chin and frowning at the jar, I'll plant some of them, I guess. He crammed the jar of seeds into his pocket and started for the door. Just a minute, Dulcie, the lawyer cautioned. Better keep them locked up here in the bank and take some of them out when you are ready to plant. Yes, by all means, Mr. Dooner, advised the banker. The seeds are apparently very valuable and you must protect them. Dulcie thought for a moment and then did as the lawyer and the banker suggested. He locked the jar of seeds up in the deposit box and went off to his greenhouse to prepare a place to plant. Too bad Dulcie didn't find a nice stack of government savings bonds in the deposit box, said Uncle Ulysses when they had arrived back at the barber shop. Yep, said the sheriff. With savings, bonds, you know just what's what. Dulcie's Uncle Derpy was a great scientist, reminded the barber, and that jar of seeds might be worth millions. Derpy was a great hand at breeding new plants and improving old ones, said Uncle Ulysses. He was an up-and-coming fellow for his generation, far ahead of his time. Remember the giant squash he developed, asked the barber. Yep, said the sheriff. And remember the derpy tremendous tomatoes? I mean, tremendous tomatoes? 
The strawberry tree was the best thing I always thought, said Homer. But the derpy dooner honey onion was the most remarkable plant he ever bred, Uncle Ulysses asserted. Looked just like any old onion, but tasted just like honey. A honey onion pie with meringue on top is one of the world's best foods. Derpy dooner was a genius, no doubt about it. Well, what do you think Dulcie's seeds will grow into? asked the barber. They were little bitsy things like grass seeds, said Homer. Something rare that old Derpy brought back from one of his expeditions to Asia or Africa, no doubt, said Uncle Ulysses. No, said Homer, the jar was labeled Experiment 13, so the seeds must be for some sort of plants that he developed himself. Farmer's Almanac says a mild spring, said the sheriff. Time to start planting next month, said the barber. It'll still be a long time, though, before we find out what Dulcie's seeds grow into, said the sheriff. Dulcie's got a greenhouse, reminded Uncle Ulysses. Golly, said Homer, Dulcie can plant today. And Dulcie did plant the same day. By 11 o'clock, he was back downtown with a truck, buying fertilizer and vitamin plant food. He was back at the bank again before noon to get some seeds. He carefully counted out 12 seeds and one more for good measure into an envelope. Once more, he locked up the glass jar in his safe deposit box and rushed off in the direction of his greenhouse. By four o'clock, when Homer stopped by the greenhouse, there was Dulcie inside, admiring the 13 damp mounds of earth where he had planted his seeds. Hello, Mr. Dooner, said Homer. Hello, Homer, said Dulcie. I'm pretty tired, and my back is sore from hauling fertilizer and from spading. You need some help, Homer suggested. School's out next month, and Freddy and I could help out doing hoeing and spraying. That is, if the seeds will grow into anything. You're hired, Homer, and Freddy too, said Dulcie. They'll grow all right, he added confidently. I put two bushels of vitamin plant food around each seed. <whistles> Whistled Homer. What kind of plants do you think they'll be, Dulcie? I don't know, said Dulcie, but whatever they are, they'll be the biggest and the best. On Saturday morning, Homer was late getting to the barber shop. He rushed in and shouted, They're up! What's up, son? asked the sheriff. Dulcie's plants! Dulcie's plants are up, all thirteen of them, Homer said. Let's go look, said Uncle Ulysses, throwing down his magazine and the barber and Homer and Uncle Ulysses went over to the greenhouse with the sheriff in his car. Look, said Dulcie, proudly displaying the thirteen tender green shoots. Healthy-looking plants, said the barber. You can almost see them grow, said Uncle Ulysses. You can see them grow if you look closely, said Dulcie, and he started scooping vitamin plant food out of a bag and sprinkling it generously around the plants. Even with a truckload of vitamin plant food to help out, the plants took weeks to get as high as Homer's head. The tallest one of the thirteen plants came just to the bottom of his ear on the day school was out, and Homer and Freddy started working at the greenhouse. They sprinkled the plants with vitamin plant food, and they sprinkled them with water. They carried bags of fertilizer, and they listened to Dulcie complain about his back. The next morning, when Homer and Freddy arrived at Dulcie's, the tops of the plants were right up touching the glass roof of the greenhouse. We have to break out some sections of the roof and give them room to grow, shouted Dulcie. Gosh, Dulcie, they're going to be trees, Freddy exclaimed. They're really a-growing now, son, said Dulcie with a happy chuckle. You boys grab a couple of hammers and start knocking some openings in the roof. You want to be careful, he cautioned, when you break the glass, that it doesn't hurt the plants. While Dulcie went off downtown to get another truckload of vitamin plant food, Homer and Freddy climbed around on the roof, knocking out openings for the plants to grow through. This is the most fun we've had on this job yet, Freddy, shouted Homer with a laugh. Yeah, Homer, but there will be a lot of crash, tinkle, tinkle. Pieces to pick up, said Freddy as he swung his hammer down. That's the sort of job that hurts Dulcie's back, said Homer, stopping to rest. Holy smoke, Freddy, look at him grow. Wow, said Freddy, and he dropped his hammer. The plants were pushing right up through the holes in the glass. It seemed as though they were glad to be out in the warm summer sunshine. 
Homer peered through the glass and saw a large stalk pushing against the roof. He bashed out a hole, and the plant popped through, spread its leaves, and seemed so grateful that Homer politely said, You're welcome, without thinking. As stories of how Dulcie's plants were growing spread through Centerburg, people began to come out and have a look. Dulcie charged 50 cents admission to the greenhouse and made $59 the first afternoon. By the end of the first week, however, business was bad. Not that the plants stopped growing or that people stopped coming out to look. The plants grew faster than ever. That was the trouble. There were three times as much plant outside as there was inside the greenhouse. Large crowds gathered on the road every day to watch them grow. Dulcie reduced the price of admission to ten cents, but still not many came inside. He was pretty mad about it, but there was not a thing he could do. They ain't very pretty plants, said the sheriff, who was on hand every day to handle the traffic problem. They're pretty enough, said Dulcie, taking offense, and bigger than anything you'll ever grow. The plants have a familiar shape, said Homer, and it seems as though I ought to recognize the leaves. Maybe they're potatoes, and under the ground, Freddy suggested. If they're potatoes, Dulcie, said the sheriff with a chuckle, you'll have to find a sheen stubble, I mean a steam shovel, to dig them out. Just you wait and see, Dulcie shouted. These plants will grow to be the biggest, the biggest something's ever grown. And he stomped into his greenhouse to spread on more vitamin plant food. Two whole weeks went by, and Dulcie's plants were producing nothing more remarkable than leaves and stems, but leaves and stems they produced like mad. The plants had become the most important feature of the Cinderberg skyline, towering way above the Cinderberg courthouse and the smokestack of the Enders Products Company. I don't think they're going to bear anything, the barber said one day at lunch in Uncle Ulysses' lunchroom. They're using up all their strength putting out shoots and leaves. Dulcie should have pruned them down. It'll be a big disappointment to Dulcie, said Uncle Ulysses. He's worked harder on those plants of his than he has since he put up the street signs out at Ender's Heights. He can try again next year and keep him pruned, said the sheriff, brushing a donut crumb from his mustache. He's got plenty more seeds locked up in the bank. The door opened, and in no special hurry, Homer walked in and sat down at the counter. Hello, Homer, said Uncle Ulysses. Have a donut fresh from the machine. No, thank you, Uncle Ulysses, Homer replied, and he sat quietly at the counter, watching the automatic donut machine make donuts. You not feeling well? Uncle Ulysses inquired. I'm feeling all right, Homer replied. Then he announced, I know what Dulcie's plants are. You do? asked Uncle Ulysses, and everyone rushed to the lunchroom window and looked across the square to where Dulcie's plants rose high above the trees and buildings on the far side. You can just make out from here, said Homer. There are thousands and thousands of buds on top. They look familiar, said the barber. That's what I've thought for weeks, said Homer. It's the size that fools you. Hold your hand so as to cover the trees and buildings and pretend for a minute that the plants are ordinary size. Everybody did as Homer suggested. Then one of the customers began to giggle, then another, and finally all the people in the lunchroom began to laugh. Poor Dulcie, laughed the barber, holding his sides. He'll never get over this, chuckled Uncle Ulysses. The town will never stop teasing him. Dulcie's plants are just giant-sized weeds. Yes, but what kind of weeds? Homer asked without laughing. Everybody looked again. This time, nobody laughed. Jiminy Zeus, cried Uncle Ulysses. The barber gulped and said, I'll have to leave town. So will I, said another customer. Me too, I'm leaving today, said another. Dad gum, the sheriff said. Now who'd ever thought them plants was wagreed? They're ragweed, all right, said Homer, and I expect they'll blossom in a few days. We'd better get the mare and go see Dulcie, Uncle Ulysses suggested, and the sober little group from the lunchroom started for the town hall. The dentist and several patients came out to see what was going on, and they joined in the group. So did the plumber, the jeweler, the printer, and the druggist. 
I have a funny feeling, said the barber, taking leave of the gathering crowd, that Dulcie will be in one of his arguing moods. I'm going right home and pack my bag. Just the thought of those things make me sneeze. An awful lot of folk are trouble with hay fever, said the druggist. Reminds me, I had better order a cartload of paper handkerchiefs. When all those thousands of buds open up and start filling the air with pollen, this place is going to look like the dust bowl, said the dentist. Uncle Ulysses and the sheriff went on into the mayor's office while the others waited outside. Almost at once, the mayor came rushing out of the town hall. He shaded his eyes with his hand, looked solemnly up and across the square at Dulcie's thirteen colossal ragweeds silhouetted against the afternoon sky. Everybody knew that the mayor was susceptible to hay fever, so they were not at all surprised when he pulled out his handkerchief, just from force of habit. For a minute, it looked as if the mayor might start running, but he tucked away his handkerchief, squared his shoulders, and started walking grimly towards Dulcie's. The crowd followed behind. Dulcie came running out to meet them. They're budding, he shouted. They got thousands and thousands of buds. Howdy, mayor, he greeted. I was just about to come see you. I wanted to ask you, would you please send the fire department out here so as I can cut off a few sprigs of buds to exhibit? My ladder is too small to reach the lowest branches. The mayor was slightly taken aback by Dulcie's request and couldn't think of what to say or how to begin. I could cut off a few sprigs for you, mayor, said Dulcie generously to help the mayor decide. They'll look mighty nice in a vase in your office when the blossoms come out. Dulcie, I... I... The mayor began and could not continue. Dulcie Dooner looked around at the solemn faces of the crowd. What's the matter? This is a big thing for Cinderberg. Don't you frown at me, Sheriff. I am being a good citizen. My plants will put this town on the map. I'm doing a lot for this town, so how about loaning me the town hook and ladder? Dulcie, uh, we began the mayor unhappily. As mayor of Centerburg, I am sorry to inform you that your plants are ragweeds. Dulcie swallowed hard and craned his neck to look up at his tremendous weeds. In the unhappy silence, the gay singing of the birds seemed out of place, and the slight rustle of the giant ragweed leaves suddenly sounded ominous in the summer afternoon. Ragweeds? Why, darned if they ain't, said Dulcie. He seemed disappointed that there would be no fruit or berries to sell. But then he smiled and said, Well, anyway, I got the biggest dang ragweeds in the world. That'll make Cinderberg famous. So look, Mayor, how about the latter? he asked. See here, Dulcie, said the Mayor. Ragweed pollen gives people hay fever. Dulcie looked around at the worried faces. Shucks, don't you trouble yourselves about me. I'll be all right. I never get hay fever. In the interest of public health and pursuit of happiness, for the best interest of the town of Centerburg, I ask you, as a good citizen, to cut down your ragweeds, said the mayor. Cut him down? cried Dulcie. Cut my ragweeds? He asked as though he could not believe his ears. No, he shouted. No, I won't cut him down and the citizens watched Dulcie turn his heel, stamp into the greenhouse, and slam the door. Didn't argue much, said the sheriff tartly. The mayor glanced uneasily up at the thousands of giant ragweed buds swaying innocently in the breeze. Sword of Damocles, Uncle Ulysses exclaimed softly. In a matter of hours, the buds will open. The pollen will... I hate to think of it. Time is important, said the mayor. We must hold a special town meeting this very evening and decide what to do. And I will welcome any and all suggestions, he added humbly, of how to deal with this, the greatest and gravest threat our town has ever known. Homer, said Freddy on the way back to town, my grandmother was right. Experiment 13. 13 plants. Superstitious, Homer replied. Let's go along with Uncle Ulysses and see what's going to happen. Everybody stayed in town to attend the town meeting as a last hope. Towards seven o'clock, Centerburg was a town of gloom. As the sun dropped lower in the sky, groups of residents gathered in the square, and as the sun dropped lower, the shadows lengthened. 
The longest shadow by far was the shadow of Dulcie's thirteen giant ragweeds, and the people watched them extend across and darken the square and ease slowly up and darken Uncle Ulysses' lunchroom, up and darken the movie theater, and last of all, the steeple of the Methodist church. From one corner of the square, there came angry shouts. Let's chop him down. Burn him. Spray him with weed killer. Spray Dulcie, too. But the sheriff was right on the job. Hold on, boys, he shouted. You can't destroy private property in this town. Let's get on to the meeting and solve this thing regular. And he headed the disturbers into the town hall along with everybody else. Everybody was there. Yes, everybody. Dulcie came, too. Seeing that his fellow citizens expected him to say something, Dulcie cleared his throat and said, I've been thinking. We could solve this problem the democratic way just as easy as that. He snapped his fingers, and a murmur of hope sounded through the hall. Yeah, said Dulcie, gathering courage. Centerberg doesn't need no crop or ragweed. At this, the murmur grew louder, and someone shouted, Good boy, Dulcie. This town doesn't need ragweeds, he repeated. Then he took a deep breath and said, When the government decides the country doesn't need cotton, the government pays the farmer to plow it under. When the government decides there's too many potatoes, the government pays to have him destroyed. Now I reckon, since Centerberg doesn't need no ragweeds, well, I reckon the town ought to pay me so's they can get rid of him. I figure a thousand dollars in expenses paid in cash ought to be a fair price. Another murmur went through the hall. The printer rose from his seat and addressed the mayor. Mr. Mayor, a thousand dollars seems a big price for a crop of ragweed. These are big ragweeds, your honor, said Dulcie modestly. This sum should be paid by the national government and not by the town of Centerburg, said Lawyer Stobbs. At this, the county agent jumped to his feet and cried, I make a motion that the town pay, Dulcie. By the time we filled out all the papers and sent them to Washington, it would be too late. I second that motion, the barber spoke up. Over the whispering of the audience, the mayor called for silence and said, A motion has been made and seconded that the town pay Dulcie Dooner $1,000 in expenses in cash for his ragweed plants. Because time is short and at any hour the plants may break into bloom, we will have an oral vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye, said everyone. Anyone against? asked the mayor. No one spoke. Majority rule, said Dulcie. It's nice we could solve this problem so democratic-like. Then he made his way to the front of the hall and handed the mayor a paper listing his expenses. Seventy bags of vitamin plant food at four dollars a bag, two hundred and eighty dollars. Two assistants at thirteen dollars each, twenty-six dollars. Rubbing alcohol for lame back, seven dollars thirteen cents. Total expenses, $313.13. The mayor read this aloud and then said, Added on to the $1,000, the total amount due to Mr. Dooner is $1,313.13. Homer, whispered Freddy, there are those numbers again. That means more trouble, shh, said Homer. Look, the town treasurer and the banker are leaving to get the cash for Dulcie. When the treasurer returned from the bank, he carefully counted out $1,313 in bills into Dulcie's eager hand. And then, just as carefully, he counted out the dime and one, two, three pennies. Dulcie stuffed the money into his pockets, and the mayor announced that after the meeting, the fire department and any men who might care to volunteer would cut down the giant ragweeds and attend to the burning of the trunks and stems and blossoms. The people were in a celebrating mood. The fire bell jangled merrily, and the fire department took over the rush job of disposing of Dulcie's plants. Groups of singing people were soon clustered about fires of burning ragweed, and it made a pretty sight, what with spotlights of the fire truck alternating red and white flashes. There was the sound of axes and saws, and then the excited cry of timber, followed by the earth-trembling crash as a stalk of giant ragweed hit the ground. Homer and Freddy peeked through the window of the bank. It was closed up tight, 
and Uncle Ulysses and his committee were not inside counting seeds. Then they looked in the barber shop. The mayor, the sheriff, the barber, and lawyer Stobbs were playing rummy, but Uncle Ulysses and his committee were not there. They finally found the seed counters in the lunchroom. Uncle Ulysses was hunched over, squinting through a magnifying glass, counting the tiny giant ragweed seeds. Every time Uncle Ulysses counted twelve, the jeweler put down a mark. And Dulcy? Dulcy was there, watching like a hawk to see that nobody made mistakes in his counting or marking or multiplying. All four were so intent upon their job that they didn't notice when Homer and Freddy arrived. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, counted Uncle Ulysses. Four thousand dozen, said the jeweler. Dulcy headed for the door. Just a minute, Dulcy, called Uncle Ulysses. There are a lot more of your seeds to count and tax. My seeds, my eye, shouted Dulcy. You can shove them all in your shoe. I never want to look at another seed. And he slammed the door of the lunchroom on his way out. What are you going to do with the seeds, Uncle Ulysses? asked Homer. Oh, hello, boys, Uncle Ulysses said. You're just the fellows we need here. Homer, Freddy, you finish counting these things. It's pretty fine work and takes a young, sharp eye. We old fellows are pretty tired, and besides, we better go across to the barber shop and report to the mayor. Homer and Freddy started counting, and the committee went off to make its report. Gosh, Homer, Freddy complained, there's still thousands of these seeds here to count, and it'll take all night. I don't see why they have to be counted anyway. It's important to count them, though, said Homer. You know something, Freddy? Counting and keeping track of every single one of these seeds is just about the most important job in Centerburg. More important than being mayor? asked Freddy. Sure, said Homer, because if one single seed got lost, it might grow into a giant-sized ragweed. If the pollen from one giant ragweed mixed itself with all the common wild ragweed hereabouts, then the next year there would be hybrid ragweed every place. Gosh, Homer, just like hybrid corn. Homer nodded his head gravely. Just supposing somebody subversive, like an enemy, was to capture these seeds, Freddy, and plant them some night right next to the White House and the Capitol. And the presidents and the senators and representatives all started sneezing with hay fever, Freddy said. Yep, said Homer. The president couldn't hold press conferences, and the senators couldn't make speeches, and I just guessed the government would come to a stop. Everything would get tangled up and disrupt the country. You see, counting these seeds is super important. And he picked up the magnifying glass and started to count giant ragweed seeds. Over across the town square in the barber shop, Uncle Ulysses and the committee had joined the game of rummy after they had reported to the mayor. It's your turn to draw a card, Ulysses. Queen of Seeds, said Uncle Ulysses, turning over a card. Zeus, he said, I keep seeing those things in front of my eyes. Reminds me, I better call up the lunchroom and see how Homer and Freddy are getting along. He picked up the phone and gave the number. Hello, Homer, how are you making out? Still have a lot to count, eh? Uncle Ulysses listened for a moment and then he said, We thought we'd just lock him up in the bank again. Nobody would ever think of planting a crop of ragweeds, except Dulcy. If they knew what they was planting, they wouldn't. Uncle Ulysses listened again and stopped smiling. Then he looked worried. Homer, he said, trying to control his voice, you just keep right on counting and be extra careful not to lose a single seed. Don't you worry, son, we'll talk it over and think of a way to get rid of him somehow. Uncle Ulysses hung up the receiver and went back to the rummy game with terror in his eyes and fear in his heart. Men, said Uncle Ulysses gravely, we've got to think hard or this country will be one big sneeze clear from the Atlantic to the Pacific coast. Why, one single enemy plane could sow those seeds from New York to San Francisco in a couple of hours. What are you raving about, Ulysses? asked the barber. It's the strain of counting all those little seeds that got him upset, I guess, said the banker. I'm not raven, said Uncle Ulysses, glaring wildly at the rummy players. You men put down your cards and listen to me. We have to think and think fast of a way to get rid of those seeds. If the wrong kind of people were to get hold of them, it would mean the ruin of this country. 
Shucks, Ulysses, we're gonna lock him up again in the safe deposit vault, so stop worrying and let's get on with the game, said the printer. Stop being so, so, so complacent, Uncle Ulysses spluttered. Banks get robbed every day, and you know it. Then he looked over his shoulder and leaned way over close and whispered hoarsely, and the kind of people I mean wouldn't stop at nothing. I'll lock them ragweed seeds up in the jail, said the sheriff triumphantly. That'll stop him. Rubbish, said Uncle Ulysses. As many as twenty people have broken out of your jail, sheriff, and it's a darn sight easier to break in. Besides, the jail's got mice. Suppose some mouse was to take some of those seeds home to a hole in the ground to feed his family. Then where'd we be? Right back where we were with Dulcie. Only this time we may not act in time. Uncle Ulysses was excited now, and he shouted, Bees and bugs! We'll have to get rid of them so they won't find them! I tell you, men, if the pollen from just one of these giant ragweeds gets loose and mixes with our wild ragweeds, we'll have hybrid ragweeds bigger even than the giant ragweeds. All the men finally realized the seriousness of the situation, and they sat glancing uneasily at one another. The mare was the first to move. He dashed over to the window and looked across the deserted square at the lunchroom. There's no use worrying those two boys about this, he said, but we had better post a guard outside while they finish their counting, Sheriff, he ordered. You take your gun and cover the front entrance. And Biggs, he said, handing the barber his keys, you'll find a revolver in the upper right-hand drawer of my desk. You guard the back entrance. The rest of us will stay here and try to dope out a solution to this problem. In case of trouble, fire a shot into the air and we'll be right over to help out. The sheriff and the barber went out the door and the rest of the men drew their chairs up close together for a conference. Now then, said the mayor, let's decide what to do. Nobody said anything for some minutes. They all sat thinking. Then Uncle Ulysses said, well, let's decide. I've heard tell that birds sometimes plant seeds in out-of-the-way places, said the banker. Yeah, birds and mice and bugs. We'll have to dispose of them some way so they won't get at them, said Uncle Ulysses. The most important thing is to keep these ragweed seeds from falling into the hands of enemy agents, said Lawyer Stobbs. Sneezing could seriously impair the functioning of the executive and the judicial as well as the legislative branches of our federal government. What can we do with them? Where can we put them? How can we get rid of them so that not one seed can fall into the hands of some enemy agent, or mouse, or bird, or bug? asked Uncle Ulysses, pacing up and down. The bank wouldn't be safe, said the banker. It wouldn't be safe to bury the seeds, said the printer. If we hide them inside a mattress, the mice would find them, said the mayor. I'm for calling the FBI right now, said the banker. There isn't a single place under the earth, on the earth, or a steeple over the earth that's a safe place to hide those seeds. Oh, the ocean, shouted Uncle Ulysses. The Atlantic Ocean. The sheriff could take the seeds to Atlantic City and hire a boat to take him to a nice deep spot. Then he could toss the ragweed seeds overboard and that would be that. That's it, Ulysses, said the mayor, slapping him on the back. There's a train for the east that goes through here at 1240 tonight. We'll send the sheriff to Atlantic City to sink those seeds. I've got a metal cash box with a lock and a nice handle, said the banker. The sheriff could carry the seeds in that and handcuff it to his wrist so nobody could steal it on the train. And I've got some heavy lead type to put in the box just to make sure it'll sink, said the printer. In shortly less than half an hour, the box was ready and back at the barber shop. And five minutes later, the sheriff came in carrying his bag, all packed and ready to go. He pulled out a pair of handcuffs, and one side he fastened to his wrist, and the other he snapped through the handle of the box. You mustn't forget to unfasten yourself before you toss the box, sheriff, said the printer with a smile. This is no time for joking, said the mayor severely. Now, sheriff. You realize how much depends on you. Don't speak to strangers on the train, he cautioned, and as soon as you get to Atlantic City, hire a boat and go out and sink the seeds. You can depend on me, Mayor, promised the sheriff. All right, said the mayor. Let's go over to the lunchroom and pick up the seeds.
Lawyer Stobbs, gun in hand, met them at the door of the lunchroom. Everything all right inside? Uncle Ulysses asked in a whisper. Yes, whispered the lawyer. I think they're all finished with the counting. Shh, what's that? He said, pointing his gun out into the shadows of the square. After a tense moment of waiting, the postmaster's dog came up wagging his tail. Everybody relaxed, and Uncle Ulysses chuckled. That dog can smell donuts cooking a mile away. He opened the door and went in, followed by all the men and the postmaster's dog. Hello, boys. All through counting, I see, said the mayor. Ah, exclaimed Uncle Ulysses. Very thoughtful of you, Homer, to make some donuts. The sheriff can take some with him for a snack on the train, and we're all pretty hungry right this minute. He paused to admire his automatic donut machine make donuts, and as he watched, the machine stopped. You didn't mix up enough batter. You should have made more. But Uncle Ulysses, we only meant to make a dozen, said Homer. Yeah, said Freddy, who had been counting the donuts as they came out of the machine. We only meant to make a dozen, then he added miserably. But it turned out to be thirteen. Well, there's enough to go around, so help yourselves, everybody, Uncle Ulysses offered. But Uncle Ulysses, said Homer. Freddy, you go to the back door and call the barber, Uncle Ulysses said suddenly remembering that the barber was still guarding the rear. Let's get the seeds in the box and locked up, said the mayor, taking a bite of doughnut, and then I'd like a cup of coffee. Freddy came back with the barber, and Uncle Ulysses handed him a doughnut. Then he turned to Homer. Get the ragweed seeds, son, and put them in that box the sheriff's got dangling from his wrist. But Uncle Ulysses, said Homer, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Then he asked, have you ever heard of a berry growing into a berry bush after it had once been cooked into a pie? Have you ever heard of a nut growing into a nut tree after being baked into a cookie? Uncle Ulysses had his mouth full of donut, and so did all the other men. So they all shook their heads, no. Popcorn won't grow after it's been popped either, said Freddy, because I tried it once. Uncle Ulysses gulped and said, Homer, you're a good boy. It's getting late, and you and Freddy run along home now. After Homer and Freddy had gone, the mayor fed the rest of his donut to the postmaster's dog. So did Uncle Ulysses and the barber and the jeweler, the printer, the banker, the sheriff, and lawyer Stobbs. Then they fed him the rest of the donuts and watched silently while he ate up every last crumb. As the last crumb disappeared, the sheriff said, there goes my trip to Atlantic City. And the barber said, From now on, every time I look at that dog, or even mail a letter, I'll probably have to sn sn snatch <laughs> sneeze. The End Experiment 13 by Robert McCluskey Thanks for listening all. I wish you fair winds and following seas. Godspeed.